Good morning, church family. It's good to be here with you this morning on this day for family dinner. That's what communion is. It's a family dinner when the family of God gathers together around the table to have a dinner together and with Jesus. Welcome to all of you who are here and those of you online. It's an honor to be presiding today in in worship. And I want to to encourage you to fill out the Connect cards. Uh, That's a way that helps me to keep people connected to the the church and keeps us connected to each other. Uh, So please fill those out. Put those in the offering plate, if you will. Those of you online, go ahead and fill that out, and you can submit that online. If you don't have a name tag, make sure you make a note on your Connect card so that you can get a name tag. Today, I want to encourage you. Oh, I forgot the people online. Uh, this is communion day, communion day, so if you can uh, can go get crackers or bread and either water or juice, whatever you have available, go ahead and have that ready so that you can share communion with us at the end of the service. So today I want to invite you just to just to sit back and relax. You know, we've been in this series where we've been I've been giving you homework every week, all the things you need to do in order to build your discipleship. Today there's no homework. So just sit back and relax. We're going to have this family dinner, but you don't have to buy the groceries. You don't have to get it ready. Well, except for Sharon, she got it ready for us. Thank you. We don't have to do the dishes. You don't even have to be the host. All you have to do is come and be aware of Christ's presence in our midst as we worship today. Watch very carefully for the presence of Christ. Listen very carefully for the voice of God speaking, whispering in your ear. You're invited. You are invited into the Holy of Holies today. Be more aware than ever that we are in the presence of the divine and allow the prelude to fill you with the presence of God as we prepare for worship today. Good morning, church family. Would you please stand and join me in the call to worship? Cry out. God does not keep silent. Cry out. We long to hear God's word. Cry out. Tell of God's wonderful deeds.
have an opportunity to share our joys and concerns with one another before we share them with God, what would you like to share this morning? Okay, uh, I heard a little bit about that, but I didn't have some of those details, so uh, thank you. Diane uh, was transported to Sioux City yesterday, that began select his mother, and uh, she is, um, they're dealing with some, some major health concerns up there, so we want to lift her up in prayer and, and Sandra, they did become members. After we talked about it, I realized, yeah, they did become members. Okay. Thank you for, for your prayers for, for Tony Van Dyke. After a couple health crises uh, in a row, like a week apart, something like that, uh, he's on his way back to work. And, and how Sue, I see she's, I don't see her sitting with you today. Is she just cold? Just cold? Okay. Okay. I knew she had her medical thing this week too, so I was, was hoping she was okay. So Dontavius, a friend of, of Amber's from the Quad Cities, uh, has, is asking for prayers for his daughter. Marcia. Marcia. Very good. Thank God for bringing Marcia into his life. Very good. Thank you. Emma Daniels and Avery Burke uh, did quite well in wrestling this, this weekend, thought in the place in the top 16 in uh, the state wrestling. So we are proud, very proud of them and give thanks for them. Oh, praying for the church to continue to grow. Thank you, Mark. If there's nothing else at this time, am I supposed to be hearing that? God, you're a God beyond time and calendar, beyond deadlines and objectives. And yet that's the world in which we navigate. One month at a time, one week at a time, one day at a time, one hour at a time. We can hardly fathom that we're already at the beginning of the second month of the year, but Lord, slow us down. Slow us down to notice your presence and power around us. Slow us down so we can take note of your abundance. Slow us down so we can notice the sparkle in the eye of a child or find patience in our moments of tears and distress. Slow us down so we can watch for those small hints of spring in the air so that we can marvel at a sunrise so we find simple awe in your creation so we can offer well-timed words of encouragement to those around us. Slow us down, dear Lord, so we can see your hand at work, especially in the challenges of our lives. Our country's political process is front and center in our minds these days, whether we like it or not. We pray for our leaders and would-be leaders. We pray for a system of government that once was the envy of the world, is showing needs of reform and correction and I'd even say repentance. Lord, use the spirit of unrest that exists in our government to speak truth to the powers that be. Raise up leaders that see beyond their own gains so that all people in this country can pursue life and liberty and happiness. And God of compassion, we pray for people around the world, especially in places where there is violence or fear, where one tribe attacks another, where people are oppressed, where families are separated, where food is scarce. There are so many, so many painful situations around the world. We offer them to you for we sometimes feel powerless, but we band together and we offer our prayers and our mission support to all of those places. Lord, we pray for people who are suffering from violence in our country and elsewhere. We pray for their children and we ask for a swift end to that violence. We pray for our friends who are grieving the loss of loved ones or jobs or homes or security or ability 
bring comfort and a palpable sense of your presence to them. For friends in our midst who are suffering from illness and for those who love them, Lord, build their trust in you. We pray especially for Diane today, for Dontavius' daughter, for Tony as he recovers, for others who are in special need of, of your healing help today. Lord, we pray for our children and their parents, for our siblings and our parents, for our friends and our neighbors. But most of all, God of mercy, we thank you for the gift of your mercy and grace that is bestowed upon all of us. You have shown us in Christ that your love is never-ending. Help us to believe that and enable us to then love one another with generous hearts. All of this we pray in the name of the Son, of your Son, and our friend and Savior, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our scripture this morning comes from Luke chapter 22, verses 14 through 23. When the hour came, he took his place at the table, and the apostles with him. He said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup, and after giving thanks, he said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I tell you that from now on, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. Then he took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And he did the same with the cup after supper, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. But see, the one who betrays me is with me, and his hand is on the table. For the Son of Man is going as it has been determined, but woe to that one by whom he is betrayed. Then they began to ask one another, which one of them it could be, which one of them it could be who would do this? Nails were first introduced and used by the ancient Egyptians about 3400 BC. Staples about 600 BC, and that kind of surprised me. The staples were so early. Screw threads were actually developed by a man named Articus Tarentum. Articus of Tarentum, uh, who was a Greek philosopher uh, who was also called the father of mechanics. Most people don't think about all the fasteners and connectors that are in their house. The nails and the screws and the anchors and all the other fasteners. For the most part, carpenters work very hard to hide those, so we don't have to look at those fasteners. But I guarantee you, if your house is still standing this morning when you got up, there are lots and lots of fasteners there. And somebody, some carpenter somewhere, sometime put just the right fasteners in just the right place so that your house would stay standing. And apparently they're doing a reasonably good job, or maybe your house would have fallen on your head. The parts and pieces are all held together by these mechanical fasteners. The, the thingamabob is attached to the whatchamacallit, and if it weren't for the little doohickeys in the ceiling up here... The ceiling would be down in our laps this morning, wouldn't it? It's all about good connections. As a carpenter, when I spent that time as a carpenter, part of my job, a big part of my job was making connections, you know, connecting the, the framing to the foundation and the sheeting to the framing and the rafters to the, to the walls and the roof to the rafters and the shingles to the roof. It, all those connections, that's really what a carpenter does. But, you know, I realized this week that my job hasn't really changed that much because I'm still making connections, connecting people to people and helping you to connect to God. 
In this series, we've been talking about what John Wesley, the founder of Methodism, calls the means of grace. And, and these are practices that help us to be connected to God. These are the nails and screws and fasteners of, of our faith, of our discipleship. They're like the things that hold the, the pieces of our house together. They hold us together as a community and hold us close to God. Without the means of grace, our discipleship would at best be weak, and at worst, it just might collapse on our heads like a house without any nails. So we've talked about Scripture. Scripture makes a great foundation for our discipleship. We talked about prayer. Prayer grows our discipleship. Simplicity which is my version of, of fasting uh, for, for those of us who live in the 21st century. I think simplicity is really the key to that fasting idea. That gives our discipleship room to grow. Remember, pushing things aside so that we'd have room to grow. And last week we talked about service, though I wasn't explicit in the, in the family service that this was connected. That's really one of, that's the fourth means of grace that we need. But nothing, I think, nothing makes the connection between people and God as well as communion does. In Protestant churches in the United States, and like the United Methodist Church, we have two sacraments, baptism and communion. Now, some traditions, you know, and I'm, as I look out here, I know a number of you come from other traditions. Uh, the Catholic Church, for, for instance, recognizes seven sacraments. And, and these two are special, though. These two are the two where Jesus said, Go, do this in remembrance of me. Go, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These are called the dominical sacraments in whatever tradition you come from. These are the dominical sacraments. And we recognize them as being very special. I'm sure that most of you know that the story that Linda read for us is, is the story from which communion comes. What you may or may not realize or think about is that Jesus was celebrating an annual feast. It was a Jewish feast of the Passover, and they were celebrating that the angel of death had passed over the children of Israel just before the Exodus. And part of that meal, part of that festival, is a meal. In fact, one of the main parts of that festival is a meal. And the bread and the cup, the unleavened bread and the wine in that meal, those are central to that celebration of Passover. And what Jesus did in that meal with his disciples is he took those symbols, he took those ritual symbols that they used in the Jewish Passover, and he filled them full of a different meaning. He filled them full of, full of a salvation meaning for us. Now, John Wesley was an Anglican priest. And Anglicans take communion every Sunday. Every time they worship, they take communion. And he commended what he called constant communion. In fact, he wrote a sermon called Constant Communion. And he argues that Jesus commands, as often as you do this, do it in remembrance of me. He argues that it means do it as often as you can. He writes, perhaps you will say God does not command me to do this as often as I can, that the words as often as you can are not added in this particular place. But are we not to obey every command of God as often as we can? Pretty good argument for having communion as often as we can. John understood, as I said, that nothing makes the connection between people and God quite as well as communion. So he encouraged Methodists to receive communion as often as they can. So what happened? What happened? Now, now instead of every week, we have it once a month. Well, it's, it wasn't a theological discussion or anything like that. It was just a practical matter. When Methodism came to the United States and the country was expanding westward, there weren't enough preachers. So they had what they called circuit riders. Those were the pastors who went from, from town to town to town riding in, on a horse, and they, they had com they'd carried communion to that village or that town whenever they came. But they could only come about once a quarter. So they got in the habit of having quarterly communion out on the western edge of the country. Thank goodness for pastors like, like Bruce Houseworth, who was a lay, a lay uh, pastor, because that's how those congregations had pastors. And, and that's how, even today, there are a lot of churches that wouldn't have pastors if it weren't for people answering that call to be lay pastors and lay preachers. 
But in those days, only ordained pastors could serve communion. So it was like once a quarter that they'd get to have communion. When things changed and there were more pastors available and each church for the most part had its, its pastor, people started, started arguing that, that maybe we should keep it at quarterly because, you know, we want it to be special. If we take it too often, maybe communion won't be special. Well, isn't that a little bit like saying we don't want to drink water too often because we won't appreciate it? I think so. There were also some people who said, it takes too long. We don't want to have communion every week because it takes too long. Well, think about it. If communion is one of the best ways to connect people with God, shouldn't preachers set their own egos aside and make the sermon just a little bit shorter so that you can have communion during the service? I think so anyway. John continues in his sermon. He, he says that there are those who say that they feel like they're not worthy. They're not worthy to receive communion. Well, let me shorten Wesley's argument here by saying no one's worthy to receive communion. No one under their own power is worthy to receive communion. It is only by the grace of Jesus Christ that any of us are worthy to receive communion. We shouldn't doubt Jesus' ability to save us or to make us worthy or make us prepare us for this special meal that we have as a family. Jesus discusses this kind of when he's washing the disciples' feet, and John says, oh, you'll never wash my feet because I'm not worthy, is what he says between the lines. And Jesus says, don't worry, I've already made you clean. I've already made you clean. We just need to spruce you up a little bit here. And that's what's happening here. Jesus already saved us. We just need to be reconnected again. And that's what communion is for, is to reconnect us with Jesus again. This idea that we're only made worthy by Jesus' grace is why I'm pretty careful with my language about receiving communion. We don't take communion because we're not worthy to take communion. We receive communion because it is by the grace of Jesus Christ that that it's given to us. So I try to be pretty careful about that language. That's also why I tear the bread off and put it in your hand. Have you ever thought about that? I tear the bread off. It's not a sanitary thing. It's not my, just my habit. It's because it's, it's part of the ritual that we're receiving. We're not taking. If you tear the bread off yourself, that's more like taking communion. So I tear it off and I place it in your hands to remind you that, no, you're not worthy, but Jesus gives it to you anyway. We receive communion by the grace of God. And John Wesley doesn't address one of the most persistent questions that I hear in this community, and part of that is because of the Catholic influence in the community. Isn't there some requirement that we understand communion before we take it? Well, my answer to that is it's a mystery. Communion is a divine mystery. It's a miracle. Even with a master's degree and studying theology for 40 years and now having served communion to thousands of people, if I had to wait until I understood communion, I'd still be waiting. We wouldn't be having communion today. It's, it's a mystery that we just accept as a gift of God, that God is doing something, and, and our understanding of it is just that big when it comes to the, what's actually happening in communion. Coupled with the doctrine of prevenient grace, which says that God is working in us before we understand anything, coupled with the doctrine of prevenient grace, this idea of communion being a mystery, means that communion should be available to everyone. That's why I I, I believe full-heartedly that communion should be available to every single person regardless of their church membership, their understanding or lack of understanding, their spiritual condition. Uh, Communion is a means of grace that God uses to change lives. So that shouldn't be denied to anybody. And that's why as United Methodists, we have an open table so that everyone is welcome Regardless of your situation, everyone is welcome to come and receive. No one is beyond God's reach. No one is too far gone. No one uh, doesn't understand enough. No one has to pass a test before they can come to communion or before they can be saved. That includes the youngest and the oldest, the most understanding and the least understanding, and everyone without a single exception is welcome to receive communion. And that needs to be expressed openly at every communion service, and that's why I try to do that every time we have communion. Now, that being said, there are a number of you, as I said, who come from different traditions, whether it's the Roman Catholic Church or the, or the Missouri Synod Church. Those are the two that, that limit who can have communion. 
and, and that's okay. That's their, that's their doctrine. We just have a different idea. Uh, but what I want to say to you is if that's the way you were taught and that's where your heart is, that's okay too. If that's where you are, there's no shame in, in remaining in your seat and communing in your heart. That's just fine. And likewise, there may be someone, uh, maybe unusual circumstances. I think I've done it maybe once in 40 years uh, when I chose not to receive communion uh, on, a, on a particular day. And, and that's okay too. You know, there's no judgment there. Uh, it's just an invitation that everyone needs, everyone needs to receive that invitation. And what I need to be clear about is that if you stay in your seat, if you don't receive communion, it's because you choose to. It's because of your heart, where you choose to be, because you're absolutely welcome to receive communion here. So there are three simple things that I want you to hear about communion today. First, communion will be, not become less meaningful the more often that you take it. Jesus declares you worthy already to receive. You don't have to worry about that. And, and third, you don't have to understand anything. In fact, maybe we should print t-shirts that say, communion, let's experience the mystery, and we'll just make a club, and we'll all experience the mystery. Now, I promised you in this series very practical teachings, and I've tried to stay very practical with, with what we're talking about today, but, but I, I wanna, the practical step I want you to take is receive communion as often as you can. And that's today, and we'll have it on Ash Wednesday, and we'll have it every Wednesday that we have our, our dinners with Jesus, and we'll have it at the end of the month. So every time you can, receive communion. Take advantage of those opportunities. It seems like a simple thing to me, but I also know that we've got a variety of people who've come from different places, and maybe this is your first or your second or third time that you've had communion with us. So, so I thought it'd be helpful to just clarify some things for you. Okay, uh, there is no wrong way to receive communion. Okay, whatever you are taught, that's fine. There is no wrong way to receive communion. And if you know all these things, if I forget something along the way, you let me know. Okay, so I, I want to make sure we're clear. Uh, communion. When I say communion is open to everyone, that means everyone, regardless of your age or your membership or your spiritual situation. Wherever you are, wherever you come from, you are welcome. For our online friends, that includes you, the, because wherever you are, if you're in your living room or your RV or if you're in Arizona, it doesn't make any difference, you are welcome as well, and I recommend uh, bread or crackers and juice or water, whatever you have available, but whatever you have, God will work through that. In this church, we usually start from the front and work our way back to receive communion. Come when you're ready. That's the important thing. Come when you're ready. If walking or standing is hard for you, make sure that you let the ushers know because they will give us the honor of bringing it back to you. We'll be glad to do that. When you get up front, and this is something that a lot of you probably haven't thought about. When you get up front, uh, one of the traditions is you place one hand on top of the other. Usually, uh, we place our, our dominant hand, right hand for most of us, out first and then our left hand on top of it and I'll tell you why in a second and you receive the bread. I'll place the bread in your hand, don't take it, okay? Uh, I won't be offended, but remember why we do that. We do that so that it's a reminder that you're receiving it as a grace from God. If you wanna say something at that point, you know, you can say amen. If you say thank you, I'll know that you're not thanking me, you're thanking God and that's okay too. Your mama just taught you to be polite. So that's okay. But those are a couple things that you can say at that time if you want to or nothing. Uh, now you'll see why I said put your dominant hand out first and the other one on top because now you have your dominant hand available to t pick up the cup. That, the hand that's usually the steadiest and the finest has the finest touch. You can pick up the cup out of the tray and then you have your bread and your juice and you can go ahead and, and eat. The, we'll say the body of Christ and the blood of Christ given for you again the response uh when you receive the bread can be amen or it can be thanks be to god something like that uh is a, is appropriate no rules there particularly you eat and drink if you wish to you can stay at the rail and that's something that a lot of people don't think about you're welcome to kneel at the altar rail and stay as long as you like uh and return to your seats when you're ready the trash cans on the end are for your disposable cups so that you don't have to carry those back to your seat just a couple notes, we use grape juice in the United Methodist Church and most United Methodist churches. 
maybe you don't know why, but the church has held a long-standing position supporting those who have trouble with substance use. So uh, traditionally, many, many years ago, the decision was made that we serve grape juice instead of wine uh, to help those who might, have, might struggle with alcoholism. And, and if you have a gluten sensitivity, the rules about you taking things and receiving things instead of taking things just kind of go out the window because I don't want to pollute your, your gluten-free wafers. Uh, they're in the little bowl over there. You please take that so I don't get gluten from my, my yeasty hands on your bread. Did I forget anything, those of you who've been here for a long time? I think I got it all. But think about, think about what Jesus was doing when he... When he had that first communion. You know, communion is a way of staying connected with him. He knew that he'd be dying. And he knew what it's like to have to lose someone we love. You know, we, we turn around expecting that person to be there and they're not there. We reach out in the dark and try to take a hand and it's not there. We get used to hearing someone's breathing next to us. And it's not there. And he knew the disciples would miss that. He knew that they would miss the sound of his, of his voice and the sound of his breathing and his presence. Sure, we know the person, the physical part of that person isn't really the part that we love, but that's the part we see. That's the part that we touch. So it's really important. It's the part we're accustomed to and we feel empty and painful and alone when that person's gone. So knowing that, when he was at supper with the disciples and knowing that he was going to die, imagine what Jesus might have said between the lines of Scripture. As he took the bread, he gave thanks to God and he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples. And, and he might have said, here, when you miss me, let this bread be a connection to me. When you touch it, you're touching my hand. When you, when you feel it, you're feeling me right beside you. Let the bread connect you so that, so that you can almost hear my breathing in the dark. Let the bread connect you so you can feel my arms around you when you're afraid. Let the bread connect you to me so that you know, so that you know deep inside you that I am with you. Take, eat, and do this in remembrance of me. This is my body given for you. And when supper was over, he took the cup. And he gave thanks to God, and he gave it to them. And maybe he said a little more than is in the Bible, something like, let this cup that is full remind you of the fullness of my presence with you. Let it remind you of my laughter coming from around the corner when I've played a trick on you. Let the fullness of this cup remind you of my love that fills this room and fills your heart. Let this cup remind you that I'm still with you no matter what. Let this cup remind you that I poured out my blood for you. Let this cup remind you when you drink of it that this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And then maybe Jesus said some other things that aren't in the Bible. Maybe, you know, let this bread and juice connect you to me and remind you that nothing can come between us. Let it be a way for you to be part of the kingdom about which I've taught. Let this bread and this juice you're eating and you're drinking remind you of all the meals that we shared together. Let this eating and drinking remind you that, that I am in you and you are in me and we are in the Father. Imagine that Jesus might have continued, let the eating and drinking of this bread and juice remind you that I've died and I have risen and I will come again. And when you eat and drink together, the Father will pour out His Spirit on you and on these gifts of bread and juice and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, my blood and my body, so that you can be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by His blood.
I lost a page. Okay, we wing it from here. (laughs) Close to the end. Jesus said, let all of this remind you of who I am and who you are and who we are together. He said, let this become a symbol for you. Let this become a ritual for you that connects us together, connects you as my disciples and my friends. And maybe he said, let all of this happen in the glory of God because God is powerful and God is wonderful and God has placed us here to be together. All of this he prayed in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit so that we might be connected to him. Amen. Go now. Your connection to Jesus is secure. Rest in his rest in the truth of his grace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.